Well, Boker Tov, I prophesied that we would be back today. And look, we're back. So <laughs> we had the eclipse, and now it's tomorrow. Rosh Hodesh Tov to everyone is the first day of the month of miracles, the month of Nisan. We had a very impromptu gathering of just a few of us in the parking lot of the synagogue. We had something else we were going to do yesterday uh, after the eclipse. And so, uh, we decided just to meet in the parking lot. <laughs> it, it turned into something more. Uh, but anyway, we ended up watching the uh, eclipse. It's really, really neat. For those of you who are outside the zone of totality, I hope you enjoyed the uh, the live stream effort we did yesterday to try to help you see. That was really, really cool. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're all still here. <laughs> The Messiah didn't come. Hey, listen, uh, in a serious note, so as many of you know, uh, people in the certain certain spheres, uh, they they like to predict the coming of the Messiah, uh, right? And there, there's people who make buku amount of money uh, on <clears throat> prophetic writings and books and, you know, people on YouTube and they get 100,000 views overnight because they say, you know, the eclipse means blah, blah. And then, you know, and people chase that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll, I, now listen, I know I'm talking to the Levitical choir, choir here because all of you who are in the Lapid world are not in that world. Or you're coming out of that world or you're sick of that world, which is why you're here. But there are also other people who watch and they're, they're not, they're just starting the journey or they're, they're, they're curious or whatever. And I want to encourage everybody to steer clear of any of those types of prophetic predictions. There was so much, the reason I, I, I make so many jokes about we're still here at the eclipse. Some of y'all saw on the uh, WhatsApp chat, I put out the, uh, the picture of the salt, which by the way, was hilarious. We had so much fun about that. Uh, but anyway, the reason I put that out there is because there was so much fear mongering. I hate to say the word again, but I have to from Christians. It was all Christians. It was the all Christian net network. I mean, absolute fear. mongering. The whole thing about the salt, by the way, was about somebody on Facebook said that the spirit of JC appeared to them and told them that don't look at the eclipse. Don't look at it. If you look at it, you'll be like Lot's wife. No, I'm not even kidding. You think, oh, Rabbi, you misread that. No, I didn't, actually. Uh, and I had a dialogue back and forth with the person trying to help them not be, as we say in Spanish, a scared. Um, but anyway, that's where that came from, that whole thing. But listen, steer clear of all that stuff. And let me tell you something that you can absolutely 100% believe. And you can cash this check at any bank. Anytime. Somebody tells you that the Messiah is going to come at a certain time, day, week, hour, month, time frame. I don't care what it is. Whatever they say this year, that year, whatever they say, whatever their prediction is, you can be 100% assured without any doubt whatsoever, it will not occur. It will not happen. 100%, 100%. Rabbi, how can you be so sure? Because, oh, I don't know. No man knows the day of the hour. That that applies when you actually break that down in the original language, when it says no man knows the day of the hour, what it actually means is that no man knows the day or the hour. That's the actual breakdown of that language. It's When it says no man, it means no human being, no man. It's very deep. I had to I had to dive deep to get there, but once you get there, you realize that's what it means. It's really astounding. So no one knows. So just rest assured, no one knows 100%. So you can save your money, don't buy the book. There's no harbinger. You don't have to worry about um you know, clicking on the video to wonder what it means. You know, it it's it's you, no one knows 100%. You, I just saved you hours of time and 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 all kinds of emotional hand wringing. And I add one last thing to this conversation, and that is that this probably won't surprise you. 
that in ancient Jewish writing, going back to the, the, the sages and so forth, they wrote about trying to predict the coming of the Messiah. And they, and I'm going to paraphrase. I've taught on this before. I've actually read the insight before. But let me go ahead and, and paraphrase. What they said was that the, uh, for the, 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 the attempt to predict the coming of the Messiah is demonically driven. Yes. Yes, I've said it. Demonically driven. It is, it is something that is driven by demons and the attempt to predict the coming of the Messiah actually attracts um, the demonic. So this is very important and, and don't play around with this. And this is why, this is why I, you know, I, I joke about this ridiculous. Can I do an eye roll? I roll all the scariness about the eclipse, but just know that all the people that like they, they, the demons have a field day with these people. You don't have time to play around with this kind of stupidity because you and I, neither one of us need more demons in our life. Okay. And when you get into trying to predict the coming of, of JC or whatever, you are inviting demonic activity into your life. Raise your hand if you, if you want that. Now, I'm not trying to scare you. Well, I am kind of actually. But what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to alert you to the demonic nature of all of this. And that's why it's so dumb. Okay, so you're wondering, why is this stuff so dumb? I'm going to, if I look at the eclipse, I'm going to become like Lot's my wife. It, it provided a lot of comedic uh, fodder, and we had a great time. It was like an SNL thing in the parking lot. It was amazing, and I appreciate the lady, actually, for inspiring that type of humor because it all makes our day better. But at the end of the day, it, this lady, whoever she is, is plagued by a demonic spirit. It wasn't it, – it's clear who appeared to her. Did she have an apparition? Did she have a vision? Yes, yeah, she did. Of course she did. Was it from God? Obviously not. Then who was it from? Well, there's only one other choice, ladies and gentlemen. Survey says. So, anyway, today we're going to be talking about arrogance, okay? So, and how it relates to Zarat. In most Bibles, Zarat is translated as leprosy. That's because... No one really knows what Zarat was exactly. There's no scientific necessarily. Um, it's a lesion. It, it, it's not leprosy, but no one had a name for it. So, it is, so the English uh, translators just called it leprosy. It's not leprosy. How, how do we know it's not leprosy? Because Zarat can afflict stone. It can afflict fabrics. It's not limited to the human skin tissue. Uh, it is not a natural disease. Someone wrote on the chat channel I read after the fact that leprosy comes because of something you eat. I don't know if that's scientifically true. I, I don't really, I, I doubt it. Okay. Um, the minute I read it, I said, mm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I've played one on television, but I don't think that that's true, but maybe it is. And maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't think I am. Um, however, <clears throat> Uh, it's not leprosy. So you don't get Zarat from something you eat. Uh, it, and as I said, it, aff it afflicts, uh, it can afflict stone fabric. It, it can afflict any material actually, uh, as the Torah tells us. So this has to do, it's, it's a, it's an illness. It's a disease that has to do with, um, actually Lashon Hara, which is haughtiness and arrogance, which is the root of Lashon Hara. Now, other things that people have said about the Torah is that some of these things like this, it's all about medical and so forth. And you've seen people dismiss the law of Moses as well. You know, they, they, these are just medical things. And now we have modern science. We don't need the Torah because, but it's not medical. The, 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 the person who was afflicted with Zarat was supposed to go and be examined by, by the Kohen. Well, but this is the only illness for which he was supposed to go to the Kohen to be examined. If he had a sore throat, he didn't go say, ah, to the Kohen. If he had, you know, it was, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, you know, I got a, I got a sore back, uh, priest. Can you, can, can you kind of check me out here? There was, the, the Cohen was not a doctor. This is the only thing, the only uh, ailment, the only illness, the only affliction for which the person had to go to the Cohen. Nobody else. There's no other disease. There's no other sickness. Okay. I got a fever. I feel like, I feel like I'm a little feverish. 
Can you check me out, Doc? I mean, I mean, I mean, priest. It wasn't like that. Okay, so it has nothing to do with medicine. It has everything to do with arrogance. And this is something that, in reality, all of us have to be on guard against. And particularly as we grow in our knowledge, because it becomes, it becomes, I think, easier to to be arrogant when one becomes knowledgeable. Now, having said that, I also believe in my experience um, that I have seen a whole lot of arrogance come from people who aren't knowledgeable. I've seen, in fact, I, you know, and it's hard to say, it's hard to say whether, is there more arrogance from the knowledgeable or is there more arrogance from the from those who lack the knowledge? Um, I, I tend towards, and this is just based on my experience, I tend, not that it really matters, because arrogance in any form is bad and something we should be correcting, but I think that people who aren't knowledgeable tend to be more arrogant, because I think that as you gain knowledge, and naturally it depends on the person, it depends upon the right attitude the person has, but it seems to me the more the knowledge we gain, the more understanding we have that there's more stuff to learn, and so therefore we tend to be a little bit less arrogant about, oh yeah, I know all things because clearly we don't. Um, you know, like, like I love people who, who say sometimes I've read the Talmud. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That's like saying I, I, I've read the Encyclopedia Britannica. Have you? No, you haven't. Okay. And, and nine times out of 10, when somebody says that, who's not Jewish, which is the only people who would ever say that are the people who have read like a sentence from the Talmud presented to them by somebody on the internet. And so they haven't actually read the Talmud, right? So, but anyway, I my point here is I think that there's plenty of opportunity to be arrogant no matter who you are, no matter what you know, uh, but we have to be careful. And for those who aren't knowledgeable, there's a whole lot of people who wax eloquently to me all the time who don't know a thing about what they're talking about. And there, so there's a lot of arrogance on both sides, right? There's people who get on this channel. It just happened a moment ago um, and, until, until one of our uh, moderators, you know, deleted it. That somebody said, you're arrogant because you don't believe in the Messiah. Well, see, this is what I'm talking about. This person gets on this channel, whoever they are and whatever, and they don't know anything about who I am and what I teach. And yet they automatically are condemning me automatically tell, judging me, automatically telling me I'm wrong, I'm telling me I'm arrogant, and so forth and so on, because I don't believe in Messiah, when, guess what? I do. Of course, it's not the JC, the fake false Messiah, the Paulinian false gospel they believe in, that's true, but I do, in fact, believe in the Messiah, the real one, Yeshua of the Gospels. But th see, that's what I'm talking about. And you and I have to be careful about that, that we don't start making judgments. And listen, this goes back to Lashon Hara, which that person who, who put that on there is definitely Lashon Hara. Um, Lashon Hara is ultimately rooted in arrogance and haughtiness and thinking that you're better than somebody else. And therefore, you automatically make a judgment. You see them doing something and you automatically think the worst of them. Why? Because you're better than they are. And we have to be careful not to do that. Do you agree with me? All right. I hope you do. Um, so let's talk about Zara. But before we do that, we've got to say hello. Y'all are all still here. Mahdi Yahu did, in fact, turn into salt. But then we resurrected him by pouring water on the salt. That's not at all true. I just made that up. But I thought it was kind of funny. So good morning, Thomas. Glad you are here. <laughs> Eastern Tennessee, Thomas. Hope you're, hope you're doing great. Shoshana Brenner, good morning to you. Ariella, good morning. Amana, good morning. Chris, Crystal, good morning to you. Tell your little daughter, hi. Good morning, Zaken, Yigal. Good morning, Leah. Good morning, Realm Warrior. Russ and Jean, hope you're doing great, uh, Russ, and uh, being blessed. Good morning, um, Micaiah. Hope you're doing fantastic. Dennis, good morning to you. And Sergio, good morning. And Sarah Merritt, good morning to you, ma'am. And good morning to Peaches, formerly from Georgia. Greg, glad you're back. Hope you had a great vacation there. And I really got some nice refreshing. Good morning, Katura. Good morning, Lori. Hope you're doing great and being fantastic. Enjoying your coffee. Thank you. 
Good morning to who else do we have here? Kelly Allard. Good morning to you, ma'am. Good morning to Kristen. Hope you're doing great. Dana, good morning to you. Nellie Grace, buenos dias. And uh, Marita, good morning, Marita. Hope you're doing great. Leah, good morning to you. Hope you're doing fantastic. Leah, that is. Haniel, good morning. Yolanda. And uh, wait, Z Ray is Zaken Rayford is on the chat. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Clayton from Helena, Arkansas. Who else do we have? Ahava, good morning to you. Uh, good morning to, oh, there's Mari Yahoo. Mari Yahoo is back. Uh, who else do we have this morning? Um, all these precious souls. Everybody's so great. Melanie, good morning to you. Good to see you, Melanie. Hope you and your family are doing fantastic. And um, anybody else that I've missed? Hopefully not. Matthew, good morning. Just going to scan through these really quickly. Bear with me. Yosef, good morning. And Emmanuel, watching from Nigeria. Good morning to you, sir. Carol Reynolds, good morning to you, ma'am. Hope life is treating you well. Paz, Rahamim. Uh, JC will judge you for the very sins he himself atoned for. Ludicrous. Um, what? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that pause, but, but you know what? I'm glad you're here. Um, I hope, hope you enjoy the program. Uh, good morning, Thelma. Um, and good morning. Uh, yeah, good morning. Yeah. So good morning, pause. I don't know. Do you think we're Christians? We're not. I'm, maybe that's your confusion. I don't know. But anyway, glad you're here. So we're going to talk about Zarat, the sin of arrogance. As we say in French, arrogance. So let's look at um, Picute Chotem. Good morning, Ami. Glad you're here. Hope you and Claire are doing fantastic. I know that coming to see us on Shabbat is Claire's highlight of her week, and that makes my heart warm. I want to begin by reading this uh, insight from uh, Pituke Hotem. He's quoting from the Parasha Zarat and Vaikra, which is Leviticus, chapter 13, Pasukim 2-3, the, the verses 2-3. to three. And it, it's he's... What that passage says, if a person will have on the skin of his flesh a discolored patch of zait or sakat or bacharet, and it shall be on the skin of his flesh an affliction of zarat, he shall be brought to Aaron the Kohen Gadol or to one of the sons of the Kohenim. The Kohen shall look at the affliction of the skin of the flesh if the hair in the affliction had turned white and the appearance of the affliction is deeper than the skin of the flesh. Then it is, it is an affliction of Zarat. The Kohen, excuse me, the Kohen shall look at it and declare to him to be contaminated. Um, so let's look at this and explain because Pituke Chotem, Pituke Chotem, when he, when he starts out here, he's talking about, he, Pituke Chotem, first of all, he likes to break down the the verses in a more kabbalistic view so he's going to be talking about haughtiness so he starts out the verse adam ki yiye but let's go back to, let's go back to the introduction we'll come back to each verse this verse could be alluded to could be alluding to he says rather haughtiness now this is a great conversation to have because we're getting ready to have all of the um uh preparedness for pesach right which includes getting rid of chametz. Now, chametz, what is chametz? A lot of people say chametz is chait. Chametz is sin. It's, it's getting rid of the sins, right? Getting rid, getting rid of the chait. Um, well, it's not exactly. Ch chametz represents something that is actually worse than sin, or, or one might say the root of sin. And the root of sin is actually haughtiness, arrogance, that which puffs up. So, in fact, the definition of chametz is often translated in the English as leaven, a leavening, but it's not leaven, really. Um, if you think about what chametz is, chametz is basically sourdough. It's essentially those five, one of those five grains that has come in contact with um, uh, water, 
uh, moisture and it is begin to ferment. It's, it, it begins to puff up, right? I, I watch um, the Rebbe scene when she made Sokhala every, every Friday. And, you know, you can see she puts the bread and then she sets it aside and it, it starts to puff up. And if she waits too long, it can get really puffed up. And then it kind of like the more puffed up it gets, like there's a certain amount of puffing <laughs> that is good. And then, but if it gets too, too much, then I understand it makes the be bread bad. It doesn't make it bad, but it, it loses flavor. She can tell you more about that. But I mean, I'm just saying that it's that puffiness, right? So it's that it's that haughtiness that leads us to sin. So what's the definition of sin? The definition of sin, chait, is breaking the Torah of Hashem, right? Breaking the Torah. Now, uh, what leads to that? What is the root of chait? Why do we want to not follow the Torah? All these people who don't want to follow the Torah, why? Why don't they want to do it? Because they think they know better than God. Ultimately, it's about it's about uh, arrogance. Ultimately, really, if you really are honest, people don't want Hashem to be the God of them, the boss of them. So they just want to do what they want to do. That's arrogance. It's the root. You know, so it says we could say that this verse is alluding to haughtiness, which is the most despicable of all the character traits. Our sages say that a haughty person drives away the Shkina from the world. This is in, in the Talmud Sota 5a. Hashem says about such a person, he and I cannot live together in the same world. A haughty person closes his eyes and heart and refuses to think about who he really is and what he has to be so arrogant about. Did he really accomplish anything on his own? He is nothing more than flesh and blood, worms and maggots. Regarding this, the sages commented upon the verse, all flesh will come to prostrate themselves before me, says Hashem. This is in uh, Yeshayahu 66 and verse 23. Now, there's a story in the, the Igres, Igres Ramban, I believe it is, where the author is talking about the sin of anger. And he used this uh, story about a king who, who struggled with anger. And he told the king told his, his, uh, his aide that every time I get angry, uh, because it, it brings out in the book and it brings also in Musar studies that anger is, and we have to be so careful about anger uh, because most anger is rooted in idolatry and rooted in arrogance. In any case, um, he told his, his servant, listen, when I get angry, um, I want you to hand me a note, okay? And the note is going to say that you're nothing you're nothing and that your end is going to be worms and maggots. And that, that was going to help the King control his anger when he realized that he was indeed nothing because anger, again, anger is rooted in the idea that you're better than, than the person with whom you're angry. Usually now is there a righteous anger? Yes, there is, but that's, I'm going to venture to say that righteous anger is rather rare. Okay. But getting back to our text, it says, they have said that if a person views himself as mere flesh, he will merit to prostrate himself and appear before Hashem. This excludes a person who views himself as an important person deserving a stature and honor. It says in Mishnat Chasadim, Mesachet Hateshuva 2.1, that usually the forces of impurity only take hold of the last two letters of Hashem's name, that is the Vav He. However, a haughty person causes these forces to take hold even of the Yud He, the first two letters. Therefore, the word Na'ave, Na'ava, Slika, haughtiness, has the numerical value of 15, which is the same as the letters Yud He. This indicates that a haughty person causes a blemish to the name Yud He and strengthens the other gods. Obviously, there are no other gods, but it's talking here about the demons. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the evil forces, as it were. Okay. Um, so looking here at the verse, he says, Adam ki yeye beor besaro she'et. If a person will have on the skin of his flesh a discolored patch of seit, okay, Sait. The word sait 
refers to haughtiness. It is related to the word heat nasut, which means to lord over others. Okay. You know, the Yeshua, the, the Messiah, actually taught about this, right? He said, you're not supposed to act like the Gentiles, lording over others, right? Now, isn't that interesting how in the false religion of Christianity, you have everybody really wanting to be like a Gentile, like that the one new man is a Gentile, is a goy, God forbid. Um. And and but at the same time, you have the Mashiach who's teaching people not to actually live like the don't be like the Gentiles, don't act like the Gentiles. And in this case, don't lord over people, right? That's the spirit of haughtiness. So it says, see what the Torah that see what the Torah in its pure and refined way of expression says about such a person. The verse says, if a person will have on the skin of his flesh, although it would have suffice to say, if a person will have on his skin, the extra word flesh tells us the disgracefulness of a haughty person and how little value he truly has. He, he has put himself on a pedestal and acting as if he were a great and important person. He does not stop to look at where he comes from and what he truly is. Mere flesh and blood, maggots and worms, dust and ashes, I, I, uh, items that have no sus substance. Therefore, the Torah emphasizes the word besaro, that is his flesh, besaro, his flesh. In other words, who is a truly haughty person? He only he is only flesh, which has no real substance. So when people come, as we had this morning, people come and they start spewing with Sean hurrah. They don't know anything about us, but they just start spewing. It's they're full of hate. They're, they're like the, the, you know, the colloquially we call these people, which is interesting because the two people are female. Um, we call them Karens. You know, they just start, you know, that's a modern term for somebody who just rants and raves. Um, that they come on, they speak of Lashon Hara. What's wrong? What's their problem? They're they're best at all. They're just flesh. They have no real substance, right? That's the problem. And see that you see that's the problem. So when we start speaking Lashon Hara, we start calling people names, and you're this, you're that. We don't know anything about them. All we're really doing is is saying that we're best at all. We're basically just flesh. We don't even have a substance. Where it's like we it's like we lack a spirit. Like you know, like the, like the Rebbe seen us taught in the Musar. You're not a body with a soul. You're a soul that has to be closed in a body. So in other words, your neshama is who you really are. So therefore, if we're running around and we're speaking with Shan Haran, we're being haughty and being arrogant, um, then really what we have is we, we're really saying we don't really have a neshama, which, which means we really don't have anything because flesh is nothing. Flesh goes away, right? So we don't want to be best, best at all. So it's, he goes on to say, Oh, safachat. Or becheret, or safachat, or becheret. Excuse me. These are varying degrees of haughtiness, and a person must distance himself from any part of it. If a person has within himself even a trace of it, he is considered as haughty and and, and an abomination. So this is why. So we're talking about getting rid of chametz for Pesach, and this is just a great reminder. We're not just getting rid of comments. We're actually supposed to be looking into ourselves and say, where is our haughtiness? And the thing is, the truth be told, all of us have a level of haughtiness in us. And the problem is the Torah is trying to tell us and our, our, our sages of blessed memory are trying to encourage us that if we have even a trace of comments, then even that trace is bad, that we're an abomination. So it's something we have to work on and we all have uh, the opportunity to do just that, right? So as we're getting rid of the chametz in our house, we're looking at the ketchup, we're looking at the the various things we have, and say, is there any chametz in it? We got to get rid of it. We got to take care of it. It's, it's very serious. It's very important. We cannot forget that the chametz we're really looking for is uh, is the chametz in our heart. And Kristen, you're right. The the, the Shan Hara kills three people. The person who says it. The person who who is who is listening and the person of, of whom is the subject. So it goes on to say the verse is telling us that if a person possesses the trait of haughtiness, it's referred to as sa'et, which implies lording over others, or safachat, which is worse, or becheret, which is even worse. 
He causes terrible dam damage to the world and gives tremendous control to the evil angel Samael. That's the Samael is the Satan, cursed be he. So basically by being arrogant, by being haughty, by talking about people, you know, we again, we see, we see it. It's, it's ironic. And that's really not ironic, actually. It's interesting that we see it displayed here this morning by the Karens who came on here. But when we see that, that it's actually what we see. It's a demonstration. Like Hashem's giving us the demonstration. This is what happens. And you empower the Samuel. Anything, like we go in there, we start blasting people. We start speaking with Sean Hara about people. And we think we're doing good. We think we're trying to like, um, you know, uh, do something favorable for God. We're not. We're actually empowering the, the Satan. That's what it's trying to say. So it's a vehaye beor, besaro, le naga araats. And it shall be on the skin of his flesh an affliction of Zarat. The word Vehaye, it shall be, contains the same letters of Hashem's name, Yud Hevave. Until now, the forces of impurity could only take hold of the last two letters of Hashem's name. But this person, through his haughtiness, has enabled the forces of evil to take hold of the entire name of Hashem. He has given control to this affliction, which is referred to as, which refers to the evil angel Samael, who is, of course, the Satan, okay? Zara'at is because we have given over the power to the Satan. So it says, Vehuva el Aharon hakohen. He shall be brought to Aaron the Cohen. The haughty person is immediately judged in heaven by Ma Michael, who is the Cohen Gadol above. So here is the other problem with Lashon Hara, haughtiness, arrogance. See, this is the problem. You know, it, it's it's like the the minute you speak the Lashon Hara, the minute you act haughty, you're brought before the Kohen Gadol in heaven. Who's the Kohen Gadol in heaven? Aaron. Excuse me, not Aaron. Pardon me. Michael, the archangel. And so I've talked about that before, how the temple in heaven is named after Memtet. The Kohen Gadol of the temple is Michael the archangel, and the souls that are being offered on the altar of the temple in heaven, according to the Zohar, are the souls of the righteous Zadokim. But the point here is that when we act haughty, we are immediately, immediately judged, judged by Michael the Kohen Gadol. Who wants to be judged by Michael the archangel? Anybody? Raise your hand up there. Or El Ahad Mi Vanav, or to one of his sons. This refers to the angels under the command of Michael. So if you're not going to be judged by Michael, then he's going to give you over to one of the other angels, and which you'll be judged. Veraam Hakohen Et Hanaga. The Kohen shall be shall look at the affliction. The affliction refers to the haughtiness that is rooted, as the verse continues. Beor be be basar on the skin of the flesh. The affliction can be recognized as follows. If the hair of the affliction has turned white, our sages said that the Yetzirah at first resembles a strand of hair. Sukkah 52a in the Talmud. Furthermore, a haughty person blemishes Hashem's name, Elohim, which is holy and strengthens other gods, which is the forces of impurity. The word halavan, that is white or levana, whiteness, has the miracle value of 87 which is the same as, a, as Hashem's name, Elohim, adding one for the name itself. In other words, the hair, that is the Yetzirah, that resembles a strand of hair, along with the affliction, which refers to the angel Samael, has strengthened these other gods. This happens because Hashem's name, Elohim, represented by the word Levan, has been turned into other gods by this haughty person. One has been blemished while the other has been strengthened. In other words, when we act haughty, when we become arrogant, and we say things, the Lashon Hara, we actually turn Elohim, Hasve Shalom, into a false deity. So the minute that you're out there acting haughty and speaking Lashon Hara and coming on programs like this and judging people, you think you're serving God, you think you're serving Hashem, but actually you've turned Hashem, God, for, God forbid, into a false deity. Now you're the servant of a false deity, which is one of the reasons why haughtiness being linked to anger. When you when you get angry, it says you're involved in idolatry. This is why. You see how it all connects? 
you can, people come on and they, they make judgments. And people make judgments all the time, right? You just judge. You don't know anything. You just make a judgment. That's haughtiness. That's arrogance. And, and, it, and it means you're serving a false, a false god. You're an idolater. You're an idol worshiper. Who wants to be an idol worshiper? So this is a uh, this is a as you can see it's a very serious problem and we need to be all of us need to be mindful not not to make judgments uh, but assume the best sometimes you know uh, you know Rebecca has talked about this in her her Musar cl uh, classes that this is why silence is so golden silence is so golden right. By the way, these uh, people who came here today and gave us an example, I pray that you make chuva. You may need to make chuva. You need to go make chuva, and, you know, and uh, ask Hashem to help you not to uh, be this way because it's very, very, very bad. He in, in no way supports it. And here's the thing. A lot of times we can be speaking truth, but we can be speaking truth um, in, a, in a very judgmental and, and haughty and arrogant way. And we, we've all done it. We're, all of us are guilty of it. Hashem should forgive us for that. And but see, the problem is, is that when we do that, again, we're empowering the Satan. So we have to be very careful. And it's hard, right? Because a lot of times the people with whom we're conversing are being very hateful in their in their speech to us. They're being being very, very um, you know, derogatory and so forth. And so they're, therefore it makes it challenging. Well, you know, that's that's the test. I, I remind myself of that regularly that uh, this is a test this is a part of my curriculum when people uh you know uh because passiv passivity is not in my nature all right um it's just not it, it you know you can't be you know marines are not good at being passive it's not an excuse it's just you know it's, it's the nature of the of the situation so therefore it's 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 a test, right? So people, when they say things to you, it's it's, it's a test to go. Okay, well, let me pump the brakes here for a minute and uh, take the high road and be silent, or you know, whatever, whatever. But my point is, is that we don't. I don't want to. And as I'm, as we're all talking about this today, I don't want to. God forbid, empower the Satan or become an idolater. God forbid, or turn my Elohim into a false deity. Yikes! Who wants that? So again, we, it's just an opportunity for us to be mindful. Umare, umara, mare, adega, amoch, meod besaro. And the appearance of the affliction is deeper than the skin on the flesh. As it is written, a haughty person does not stop to think that he has no reason to be haughty. There is nothing but he is nothing but flesh, dust, worms, and maggots. Thus, the appearance of the affliction, that is the haughtiness that gives power to the evil, uh, evil Samuel Amok Meor Besaro is is deeper than the skin of the flesh. In other words, this person does not contemplate where he comes from and what he's made of, real, realizing that he's mere flesh and has no reason to be haughty. The idea is hidden from him. It's deeper than he cares. To look, rather he look he holds on to the trait of haughtiness that has become deeply rooted in him. Um, Veirau. Hakoin Vetime Oto. The Kohen shall look and declare that he has been contaminated. He's Tame. When the Kohen sees such a person, he will immediately declare him to be contaminated. Okay. So what it's teaching us here is that we do not have the uh we don't have the luxury of being haughty. We don't have the opportunity, we don't need have the time to uh to spend we don't have the we don't have the capital let me put it that way um to take all of our mitzvahs and throw them into the garbage and one last thing on that by the way as we conclude this conversation about haughtiness we, we none of us want zarat in, in one way or the other spiritual or literal but something else to remind all of us about and this is very important the minute that we slander someone or judge them, you know, speak Lashon Hara about them um, and so forth. All of our mitzvot is transferred to them and all of their sins 
are transferred to us. Likewise, obviously, when somebody slanders us, so they speak Lashon Ra against us, or judge us, or whatever, same thing happens. All of their mitzvot are transferred to us, and all of our sins are transferred to them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, who 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 wants that exchange? In other words, if you're somebody and you you have a tendency to to want to judge somebody or speak harshly about them, and listen, this is why it's such a it's this is why it's such a bad sin. Who wants that? Who wants to give all the mitzvahs away? Who wants to take the sins of somebody else upon themselves? It's very serious, and all of us have to watch it because all of us are guilty of it. There's no one who this is. There's no one who's not guilty of it. This is why uh, Yaakov wrote about it in his letter. He specifically spoke about Lashon Hara as he was trying to bring correction. He was trying to bring correction to the false uh, teachings of Paul, and I believe that part of his conversation about Lashon Hara had to do with Paul and his tongue speaking ill against uh you know the the, pe the people who were teaching the, the real gospel and it's a reminder to all of us to really watch that and so as we're preparing for Pesach let's just all of us try to make an effort to watch our tongue and you can by the way just know that Satan is going to work through those people to push you and to try to tempt you through their arrogance and their haughtiness and their judgmental spirits that that test is going to be applied because the Satan is going to try to get you to do the same thing, you know, right. It should be obvious. All right. End of our Aliyah today. Thank you so much for being here. We'll come back tomorrow for more Tazria until we meet again. Have a great and amazing day. Please remember to donate to Lapid Judaism. Uh, let's all be tithers. I know that all of you are really doing that and making it happen. I'm very proud of you. And thank you for that. We really need to make sure that every single member of Lapid is a tither. No one, that, that's that's like, a, it'd be like a first in history. And we need to make it happen because it's going to change everything. So thank you so much. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Shalom Aleichem.